Okay, welcome everyone. We're continuing on our series of similes of the hindrances. So last week I uh, spoke about the first one, desire, and tonight I'm going to do the second, which is aversion or ill will. Um, but in my mind, this sort of includes any uncomfortable or negative kind of emotion because if we're feeling like grief or depression or anxiety, we're going to have most likely have aversion to that. So I think it covers basically all the other, all the other emotions besides desire. Um, now, but before I do that, I just want to make a few comments about desire because I think there's so much misunderstanding about this particular hindrance. Um, before we, you know, before we get introduced to the, the teachings of the Buddha, um, we're getting all of our happiness in life from um, being externally oriented to all the various sensory experiences, beautiful sights, beautiful sounds, nice tastes, <laughs> you know, all of, all of the various senses. And um, when we listen to the teachings of the Buddha, we hear about the drawbacks of pinning our happiness on these things because they're sort of unpredictable. They may or may not come about. They're impermanent. They may take a lot of effort <laughs> or put you in debt. So there's, there's um, many drawbacks, but until we've developed the happiness that comes from our meditation, either from living a moral life, being kind, being generous, developing stillness, developing stillness in our practice, or developing wisdom where we really, um, on a gut level, see the drawbacks, we can't go around saying, oh, I should let go of desire. <laughs> Because until you've developed this inner happiness, if you go and give up your happiness you're getting from the external world, you're going to be miserable. And, and the, you know, the whole point of a study in Buddhism is to be happy. <laughs> the Dalai Lama wrote that book, The Art of Happiness. You know, it's, it's um, all about letting go of suffering. So I just wanted to make that very clear that you you know because last week we had some people who were saying ooh you know like I should be doing this or should be doing that no once you develop that inner that inner peace and happiness then all the effort it takes to manifest things out in the external world it just feels like so much effort for something that's of a lesser quality than what you're experiencing internally and so there's just a very natural wanting to, to let go. It's nothing forced at all. It's just a natural progression. So I just wanted to make that clear. Now, except there is one occasion. <laughs> Every time you sit down to meditate, then you're going to temporarily let go of desires because when you're sitting down to meditate, you're trying to learn how to develop that stillness of mind that does give us that inner happiness. And so just for the time, you know, for the 30 minutes or one hour that you're meditating, you're going to be setting aside desires so that you can, you know, work on training your mind to be still. Um, but otherwise, once you're off the cushion, just let, let that uh, happen naturally. Okay, so we're on the second hindrance, uh, ill will or aversion, and this one's way easier to let go of because it doesn't feel good. <laughs> and so there's a, a, a much stronger motivation to let go of it. Um, Um, because if you express, like if you're feeling negative and then you're expressing that externally, then you're creating um, 
sort of negative karma for yourself, which is not good. So we want to prioritize letting go of this, of this, um, of this hindrance. And this can be done, you know, it doesn't take all that long uh, to really tone this hindrance down. I think what lasts a lot is the aversion part, like every time we're too hot or too cold or hungry or <laughs> all kinds of things then there's probably going to be a tendency to feeling aversion to that. So that's a, on a more subtle level than getting really angry and wanting to, to yell or hit or whatever. Um, so that lasts longer, but the, the really overt manifestations of, of ill will or anger, they, I think they're, once you start training your mind, they're, they're not too difficult to let go of. Now, here are the, hind the um, similes for this hindrance of ill will and aversion. So the first one compares ill will and aversion to being ill. And it comes from Diga Nikaya, uh, chapter 2. Um, so here's the Buddha speaking. Suppose there was a person who was sick, suffering, gravely ill. They'd lose their appetite and get physically weak. But after some time, they'd recover from that illness and regain their appetite and their strength. Thinking about this, they'd be filled with joy and happiness. So just how good it feels to be rid of that hindrance. The second simile uh, is a more extensive one, and it compares this hindrance to various states of water, and that's in the Samyutta Nikaya, chapter 46, Sutta 55. Then Sangharava, the Brahmin, went up to the Buddha and asked, What is the cause, Mr. Gotama? What is the reason why sometimes even hymns that are long practiced don't spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. And why is it that sometimes even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced? So he's asking, why is their memory good at some times and terrible at other times? And the Buddha answers, Brahman, there's a time when your heart is overcome and mired in ill will, and you don't truly understand the escape from ill will that has arisen. At that time, you don't truly know or see what is good for yourself, good for another, or good for both. Even hymns that are long practiced don't spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. So here's the simile. Suppose there was a bowl of water that was heated by fire, boiling and bubbling. Even a person with clear eyes checking their own reflection wouldn't truly know it or see it. So they're using the water as a mirror. And of course, when it's bubbling, you can't see anything. In the same way, when your heart is overcome and mired in ill will, then your memory is going to be poor. There's a time when your heart is not overcome and mired in ill will, and you truly understand the escape from ill will that has arisen. Suppose there is a bowl of water that is heated, that is not heated by fire, not boiling and bubbling, so it's very still and clear. A person with clear eyes checking their own reflection would truly know it and see it. At that time, you truly know and see what is good for yourself, good for another, and good for both, and your memory's good. Then the Buddha ends this simile by uh, discussing the right path to awakening. The seven, factors of the seven awakening factors are not obstacles, hindrances, or corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to enlightenment. So this is what I talked about on my last talk on mindfulness, that once we put in our baseline of morality and kindness and generosity, then we sit down to meditate, but then we're foiled by the hindrances coming up and interfering with our practice. 
And so then we employ the four right efforts to let go or prevent the arising of the hindrances, but then to develop these seven factors of awakening. Um, so that's sort of the basic summary of our, of our practice. Okay, so how do we let go of this ill will and aversion when it arises? So the goal of the antidotes is summed up in these two verses from the Dhammapada. So it's Dhammapada chapter 3, numbers 5 and 6. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear such a grudge, hatred is never laid to rest. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear no such grudge, hatred is laid to rest. For never is hatred laid to rest by hate. It's laid to rest by love. This is an ancient teaching. So I'll tell you a little story about, um, I think my first week when I graduated in psychiatry and got a, a placement on, um, in the psychiatry unit at the general hospital. There was this huge punching bag hanging from the, in, the common, in the common area of the unit. And I had read the, the research on this that, you know, the research shows that if you're angry and you try and get rid of your anger by punching, punching a bag or something, for most people, it intensifies the anger. <laughs> so I was able to get the bag removed. <laughs> Um, now, the first set of instructions um, that the Buddha gives to let go of ill will and aversion is given in Anguttara Nikaya 5, chapter 5, number 162. Meditators. A meditator should use these five methods to completely get rid of resentment when it has arisen toward anyone. What five? You should develop love for a person you resent. You should develop compassion for a person you resent. You should develop equanimity for a person you resent. Or if that isn't possible, you should disregard a person you resent, paying no attention to them. Or you should apply the concept that we are the owners of our deeds to that person. This venerable is the owner of their deeds and heir to their deeds. Deeds are their womb, their relative, and their refuge. They shall be the heir of whatever deeds they do, whether good or bad. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. A meditator should use these five methods to completely get rid of resentment when it has arisen toward anyone. So I think what they're trying to say here is that if you recognize that this person is just creating bad karma for themselves, and that could, you know, you don't take it personally. This is something they're doing. You don't take it personally. And it might arise compassion in you because you, you see that they're really shooting themselves in the foot. Um, if it's somebody you don't know, it might be hard just to conjure up metta or love for them. But... <laughs> But I find it easier to do the compassion part because I, I can see their suffering and then that sort of just naturally arouses compassion. Um, I think the metta, the feeling love for <coughs> this person is easier if there's somebody you know because then you, you're aware of all their, all their good qualities, all the wonderful things they've done, all the good times you've had together. And you just know they're, they're just, you know, something's happened and they're, this is just sort of a small piece of their life. And because you can sort of look at them holistically, then you can, you can continue to hold that love for them or that compassion. But that's, that happens more in somebody who has a trained mind. If you have an untrained mind, then the typical reaction when somebody starts yelling at you or whatever is that you get triggered and then you shut down and you go into this tunnel vision and all you can see is how the person is at this very moment. All you can see is their anger. And then you get angry back because you're trying to protect yourself or 
whatever, you don't feel this is correct. Um, so, and actually this is going to be talked about in an upcoming simile. Equanimity, that happens um, when you're not triggered by the other person's behavior. You can just see they're having a bad day and you don't take it personally. Now, if you can't do any of those things, then the Buddha is saying, you know, stay away from that person. Don't bring them to mind, because <laughs> if you're bringing them to mind, you're just getting all worked up and upset. And, and take a period of time where you're not having contact, you're not thinking about them. And then after a while, and this could be a few minutes or a few decades, <laughs> depending on how gross the situation is that, that happened, um, then you could bring them to mind and see what happens. Do, can you feel equanimity? Um, if not, leave it some more time and then check in again after another period of time to see, am I equanimous now? So when you finally can bring this person to mind and, and feel peaceful, then that's the time to f consider what should I do about this? Like, is this relationship really not worthy of continuing? I just don't ever have a relationship with this person again? Or uh, is this is this something that I want to try and work out with this person? If it's your partner, that's probably the, the way to go. If it's, you know, if it's somebody you're really close to, then you may want, may want to work it out. Or you may decide it's water under the bridge and you carry on the relationship, but you don't really discuss what happened. And um, this third situation happened for me um, when my father died. Um, my parents met in Vancouver. They, my father had moved from Manitoba and my mother had moved from Alberta. And um, so when I was born, I really didn't have any relatives other than my immediate family, except for my father's sister. She had uh, come to Vancouver before him. So I had one aunt <laughs> that I grew up with and uh, was very close to her, loved her. We spent a lot of time together. Um, but then when my father, he was a smoker and he died of lung cancer. Anyway, when he was diagnosed, my aunt was, I was in medical school and um, my aunt was pushing me to push his doctors to do something, but this is over 50 years ago and at that time, if you had lung cancer, it was considered game over. There was, at that time, there was no treatment. I think nowadays there is, but at that time, it was, there was nothing. And um, so I certainly wasn't, you know, as a scared little medical student, I was going to talk to some surgeon and push him to do something that they weren't going to do because <laughs> there was no treatment there considered. So um, I didn't talk to his doctor. Um, anyway, my father died and then we had the funeral and then, um, after the funeral, a whole bunch of people came to the house, but my aunt didn't come, so I phoned her up to, to talk to her to find out why she wasn't there. Anyway, when I reached her, she started screaming at me, saying she never wanted to see me again in my life. She was just so upset because I hadn't saved my father. You know, here I was studying medicine, and I'd let my father die. Anyway. I was just, I remember lying on my mother's bed, bed uh, weeping, and my mother was fairly wise. She just said, well, she's just really upset, but I was devastated. I mean, here was my aunt, my sort of closest relative after my parents, and she never wanted to see me again. Um, anyway, I was, in, I was in Alberta at the time um, uh, studying, so I went back home. And it was maybe, you know, close to a year before I made it back to Vancouver to visit my mom. And um, I phoned my aunt and everything was okay. It was kind of like, it was just exactly what my mom had said. She was just upset. So I never, I never opened the topic. I never talked about what had happened. Just sort of carried on. So that was sort of like the third, 
thing, you know, like if somebody's really angry at you, um, either you just break relationships, you talk about it, or you just sweep it under the carpet. So that was a sweeping under the carpet example. <laughs> and we had a, a beautiful relationship until her death. Okay, the next set of instructions is uh, again in Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 5, number 162. And um, so the first one I read didn't give very many detailed instructions, just said, love the person, have compassion for the person. This one is giving some more instructions uh, on how to let go of resentment. How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of body is impure, but whose behavior by way of speech is pure? So they're acting badly, but they're talking nicely. <laughs> suppose a meditator, or no, this would be a, 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 a monastic. Suppose a monastic wearing rag robes sees a rag by the side of the road. They'd hold it down with the left foot, spread it out with the right foot, tear out what was intact, and take it away with them. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore that person's impure behavior by way of body and focus on their pure behavior by way of speech. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of speech is impure, but, but whose behavior by way of body is pure? Suppose there was a lotus pond covered with moss and aquatic plants. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They'd plunge into the lotus pond, sweep apart the moss and aquatic plants, drink from their cupped hands, and be on their way. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore that person's impure behavior by way of speech and focus on their pure behavior by way of body. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of body and speech both is impure? but who gets an openness and clarity of heart from time to time. Suppose there was a little water in a cow's hoof print. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They might think, this little bit of water is in a cow's hoof print. If I drink it with my cupped hands or a bowl, I'll stir it and disturb it, making it undrinkable. Why don't I get down on all fours and drink it up like a cow? Then be on my way. So that's what they do. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore that person's impure behavior by way of speech and body and focus on the fact that they get an openness and clarity of heart from time to time. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of body and speech is impure and who doesn't get an openness and clarity of heart from time to time? Suppose a person was traveling along a road and they were sick, suffering, and gravely ill, and it was a long way to a village, whether ahead or behind, and they didn't have any suitable food or medicine or a competent carer, or someone to bring them within a village. Another person traveling along the road might see them and think of them with nothing but compassion, kindness, and sympathy. Oh, may this person get suitable food or medicine, or a competent carer, or someone to bring them within a village. Why is that? So that they don't come to ruin right here. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore the person's impure behavior by way of speech and body and the fact that they don't get an openness and clarity of heart from time to time and think of them with nothing but compassion, kindness, and sympathy. Oh, may this person give up bad conduct by way of body, speech, and mind 
and develop good conduct by way of body, speech, and mind. Why is that? So that when their body breaks up after death, they're not reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld, hell. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. Now, how should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of body and speech is pure and who gets an openness and clarity of heart from time to time? So they're speaking about if you get jealous of good people. <laughs> Suppose there was a lotus pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean with smooth banks, delightful and shaded by many trees. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty and parched. They plunge into the lotus pond to bathe and drink. And after emerging, they'd sit or lie down right there in the shade of the trees. In the same way, at that time, you should focus on that person's pure behavior by way of body and speech, and on the fact that they get an openness and clarity of heart from time to time. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. Relying on a person who is impressive all around, the mind becomes confident. A meditator should use these five methods to completely get rid of resentment when it has arisen toward anyone. So when we get angry, it's because we're unwisely attending to the fault of the other. Um, seeing somebody seeing somebody with unwise attention means that anger or aversion is a, accompanying what we're seeing because we don't want it to be that way. We want the person or situation to either to disappear or to change. Um, so wise people can see faults in others but they see them with wise attention like without anger or aversion arising. Instead, they're feeling compassion or equanimity. Okay, the final sutta I'm going to read is Anguttara Nikaya 10, chapter 10, number 80. Meditators, there are these 10 methods to get rid of resentment. What 10? Thinking, they harmed me, but what can I possibly do? And then it, so it goes past, they are harming me, present, what can I possibly do? Or they will harm me, what can I possibly do to get rid of the resentment? Um, or past, present, future, they harm someone I love or are harming someone I love or will harm someone I love or they help somebody I disliked <laughs> are helping somebody I disliked or will help somebody I disliked. But what can I possibly do? And you don't get angry for no reason. These are the 10 ways of getting rid of resentment. So I think this one's basically saying that you're, you realize that your anger isn't going to improve the situation. Uh, it's just stabbing yourself with a second arrow. Now, I want to make it clear that this is just talking about how to be at peace within ourselves. If you're in a situation, you know, where uh, it's dangerous or you're being harmed or somebody else, I mean, you, of course, you're going to do something to set boundaries, get out of the situation, whatever. Um, so this isn't talking about de being a doormat and letting people harm you. <laughs> this is just talking about our our inner world. Uh, it's not helping things to sort of be boiling with anger when something's going on. It's just making the situation worse for ourselves. Okay, I've got a few more comments here that came from Dhamma Talks, I, I, so I don't have a Sutta reference for those. Um, to know that we're angry takes mindfulness. Um, if you tend to be a person who's angry a lot, feeling angry just is sort of like a norm, and so you may not even realize <laughs> that, that you're angry because it's just such a norm for yourself. So uh, the suggestion there is um, in order to start learning is you wait for a moment when you're feeling happy or joyful, really notice what that feels like, and then when you're in the next angry situation, just compare 
and then you'll start to learn learn what anger feels like. Um, the holding technique, which I talk about ad nauseum, <laughs> is a very, very helpful way to uh, deal with anger. Another suggestion is to get curious about what has triggered your aversion, because probably you're telling yourself a story which may have nothing to do with what's happening at the time. And I have a little example of this. Um, last week, I came home from somewhere, and of course, whenever I come home, I'm running for the toilet. <laughs> and as I was running up the stairs, I heard I and Bodhipala saying something, and I, um, and I wanted to be involved in that conversation, so I just sort of called out, um, you know, that I wanted to be involved. And I was probably sounded a bit tense, but it had nothing to do with them. It had everything to do with my full bladder. So, <laughs> and so I came back and, you know, there was a bit of distress because they thought I was upset. You know, anyway, we cleared it up in a few moments, but just an example of how you can so easily tell a story to yourself that has nothing to do with the situation. Um, uh, another way to deal with aversion is to cultivate joy. If you know, if you have a, a pain somewhere in your body, maybe you can find a, a part of your body or focus on a part of your body that's very comfortable, it feels good, and you can focus there instead of where the pain is, um, or focus externally. Um, I'm on some medication right now, which is causing gout attacks. So I was I was out bird watching the other a uh, few days ago, and so it was hurtful. I was walking, and it was hurting to walk. But I was focusing on the birds, and so whenever my mind was on the bird sounds and looking at the birds, I wasn't focusing on my foot, and I was I was comfortable. Um, and then the last one is cultivating noble friends in conversation. So a noble friend is somebody who really is walking around with loving kindness, like meta most of the time. They don't, they don't uh, speak angrily and they don't rehearse things in their mind to conjure up anger, more anger. Um, they're kind, generous, patient, understanding, so they can be kind of like a role model for you. Okay, so that's the Buddha's words on ill will and aversion. So I can open it up for comments or questions or discussion. Yes? Given that a lot of people's poor behavior, whether it's being angry, offensive, aggressive, comes from not necessarily the situation, but something from their past, people who were potentially right. that way. Yeah. What does Buddhism say about terminating relationships? Yeah, well, that was the one that I, I read out there that don't associate, don't bring them to mind, and then when you can look at them with equanimity or think about them with equanimity, then you decide, should I just never get involved with this person again? Yeah, so that was one of the, one of the options. And how do you distinguish avoidance? Like, isn't avoidance a hindrance? No, I mean, why do we have friends? We have friends because they're fun to, you know, they do things we like to do, like going hiking or canoeing or skiing or something, and you enjoy being with them. Um, you know, why do you want to be a friend with somebody who's miserable with you all the time? Um, you know, we can have a lot of compassion for them, but um, but it doesn't mean that we have to be in relationship. You know, it's more difficult if it's family, you know, if it's family members. Um, so, but people still do cut off relationships, even with family. 
Yeah. I mean, it'd be very nice if these people could get some help or get some education. And that could be suggested, but it may not be accepted. I mean, you never want to give suggestions to somebody who's angry while they're angry because yeah. nothing's going to go in. If you're going to suggest something, it needs to be when they're in a calm state. And then it's, there's a possibility. Um, I just think of Beth Upton and how mm -hmm. she left her, the monastic life because she knew she kind of was, it was too easy and that there was no adversity and, or there's, and she kind of had to go and address those things. Um, I don't know if it's similar or not. Yeah. Well, that was something that, that she felt she had to do. Yeah, so I think it's going to vary for, vary for people. But I certainly wouldn't force myself to be in relationship with somebody who was angry at me all the time. I think she was mostly referring that just being in lay life is, you know, a much, um, you know, many more things going on than if you're in a monastery. Yeah. Any questions from the Zoom room? example of what we're talking about when you're saying cutting off a relationship with someone. So it's not your job to continually take abuse and harm yourself. That's mm -hmm. not your job. You get the first arrow unexpectedly and then it's your job to decide what to do with the second arrow. Do I just stay in the situation and let it keep hitting me and hitting me and harming me? Mm -hmm. Or do I let it go? I guess one yeah. so would be. Yeah. Yeah. If there's nothing more, then we can just end. And our Brahma Vihara today is compassion. <laughs> So first of all, bring to mind somebody you know with great physical or mental suffering. And while being aware of their particular difficulties, direct these phrases to them. <clears throat> May you be free of your pain and sorrow. May you find peace. Now send the phrases to yourself. May I be free of my pain and sorrow. May I find peace. Now think of someone who's been very supportive of you and send the phrases to them. May you be free of pain and sorrow. May you find peace. Now think of a neutral person, someone you don't love or hate. Send the phrases to them. May you be free of your pain and sorrow. May you find peace. And now bring to mind someone that you have a difficult relationship with and send the phrases to them. May you too be free of your pain and sorrow. May you too find peace. May all beings be free of pain and sorrow. May all beings find peace. Remember that all beings face great potential suffering, no matter how fortunate their immediate circumstances may be. This meditation does not eliminate suffering. What we are doing is being able to acknowledge suffering, to open to it and respond to it 
with a tenderness of heart which allows us to join with all beings and realize we are never alone. May the merit of our practice be shared with all sentient beings, named and unnamed. These, Blair, Ryan, Simon, Mudita. May all beings be well and happy. Thank you, everyone.